Uh, my name's Ace. I'm a developer programs engineer here at Google Cloud. And today we're going to be talking about how to keep up with serverless, so design pattern evolutions for this scalable future. So first, I wanted to take a moment to clear up some confusion on what we mean when we say serverless. A lot of people think when you hear serverless, oh, that's compute. That's things like AWS Lambda or Azure Functions or Google Cloud Functions. But here at Google, we define serverless a little bit more broadly than that. So in particular, when we're talking about serverless, we're referring to any platform that has the following traits, say, not just compute. Uh, so the first of these traits is plug and play auto scaling, which essentially means that no matter how many requests you throw at this thing, it'll scale up and scale down within reason, right? Uh, the second key trait of serverless platforms is that they support what's known as scale to zero behavior, right? So this uh, means that essentially if you don't direct any requests at your serverless platform, that it will not charge you for that period. So not only do they scale up and scale down based uh, on load, they can also scale down to the point where they won't charge you if you don't actually direct any load at them. So this, combined with the typical low to no configuration experience of many of our serverless platforms, means that they have a low, uniquely low initial cost to get started on, especially if you're developing a totally new application. Now, last but not least, uh, serverless platforms are provider managed, right? And what this means is back in the old days, if you wanted, say, a NoSQL database, right, you had to worry about the infrastructure underlying that database as well as the database itself. Nowadays, we can say, OK, hey, Google, give me a NoSQL database. I don't want to worry about the underlying infrastructure. I want you to take care of that, right? And Google can say, yes, that's, that's something we can do. That's called Cloud Firestore or Cloud Data Store, right? Um, so a couple other things I wanted to cover uh, in terms of high-level caveats with serverless. And uh, this is all background, by the way. We'll get to the good stuff in a couple slides. Um, so the first high-level caveat here is that uh, the way serverless does scalability is sort of no questions asked. I'll get into more detail about this later, uh, but suffice to say that this can backfire. Uh, second, the additional abstraction inherent in the serverless model uh, means that it's typically easier to use and easier to get started with, uh, but it's also less visible and configurable uh, when it comes to your deployments versus, say, the infrastructure as a service model. So a uh, quick plug for serverless hosting on GCP. Uh, I just want to take the opportunity to level set everyone in the audience as to what our products are. So off to the left, we have our functions offering Google Cloud Functions. Um, and those essentially take tiny snippets of code and scale those uh, to whatever the demand may be, right? Uh, to the right of that, we have App Engine, which takes uh, applications, effectively uh, sets of URL routes that map to functions. Uh, to the right of that, we have our newest serverless product called Cl Cloud Run, uh, which will allow you to run containers in a serverless and scalable manner, right? Uh, now, those three are our sort of true serverless options, if you will, uh, because they support all three of those traits. To the right of that, we have some serverless-like options, such as Cloud Run on GKE, Google Kubernetes Engine, or perhaps even raw GKE itself. And those are not quite serverless, because they don't have all of those traits. In particular, they require some degree of management. They are not provider managed. Um, but they have some of those traits. So they're sort of serverless-like in nature. Now, when you're trying to decide which one of these products is right for you, of course, there, is, you, there could be reams written about the subject. Uh, but generally, what you want to do is start off to the left, start off with the most abstract option, and then work your way right as you find that the abstract options don't fit your needs for whatever reason. Um, so enough about the sort of intro. I wanted to take uh, some time now to go over some common patterns that we'll see within our patterns ourselves, sort of meta patterns, if you will. So the first common trait that we're going to see in these patterns today is we're going to see lots of asynchronous behavior. We're going to see lots of things like message queues, right? Second, uh, we're going to see lots of decomposition. So we're going to take these large tasks, decompose them into many smaller ones that can then, third, be distributed amongst a series of many machines. So fourth, uh, we can have non-serverless components in our serverless architectures. There are a lot of caveats to this, which we'll kind of touch on in a later slide. But suffice to say, yes, it can be done. And last but not least, I kind of alluded to this in the previous slide, self-hosted primitives like databases are increasingly becoming provider managed. And the so what of that is you, uh, is you, the developer, is less concerned about the ops and more concerned about whatever the platform does, right? So you're not thinking of this as, oh, this is a NoSQL database running on a Linux instance. You're just, this is a NoSQL database. That's it, right? So uh, in terms of the benefits of these patterns, um, the first big benefit is that distributed architecture gets a lot easier compared to the pre-serverless world. So 
uh, when it comes to things like Kubernetes and orchestration, uh, they're increasingly becoming sort of optional, right? If you want that fine-grained control, you can get it through things like Knative. But if you're like me, you just want to deploy an application and have it scale, uh, then you can rely on things like serverless to kind of abstract those, uh, that ops, that orchestration away for you. And of course, uh, distributed ar architecture primitives are no different. They are also transitioning to serverless, just like the general cloud primitives as well. And last but not least, these serverless distributed architectures are more or less just as scalable as the old school distributed architectures. So we don't really lose that much in terms of scalability by moving to serverless. And uh, another thing I wanted to touch on here is that separation of concerns gets a little easier, right? Uh, or rather, there are things we can do now with serverless to increase our separation of concerns. So uh, oftentimes, separation of concerns is helpful. Uh, it will make your code base easier to work with and to go through and to maintain. Uh, not always. Sometimes it can backfire. This is one of those things where it might make sense for you. It might not um, judge based on your particular fact situation. Uh, and of course, serverless and these other new patterns, uh, like the microservice pattern, allow us to achieve higher degrees of separation in our code bases. And uh, now that we've talked about some of the motivating factors behind serverless, some of why we do it, I wanted to take a moment to touch on sort of the things that we want to change going into this serverless world, right? So uh, of course, there are some things we want to change, but there are also things we want to keep, right? And because we're all positive people here, we're going to focus on the things we want to keep first. So the first thing we want to keep is the presence of this idea of separation of concerns, right? Uh, so in particular, uh, we probably if you're coming from the old sort of application development world, you might have heard of this MVC idea, right? Uh, and essentially what that is is you take a client-facing application, you break it down into three components. You have your models, your views, and your controllers. Uh, now, for those of you who are not familiar with this uh, model, no pun intended, uh, basically what happens is your models are your database schema, your views are your front end, and then your controllers are essentially your business logic, right? Now, of course, this was a step in the right direction, but for reasons we'll get into later, we can actually do better than this pattern. Another thing that we want to keep is how we do distributed architecture. So we knew back then that it could give us less coupling and higher throughput compared to non-distributed architectures. And we also knew that it was one of the few ways to truly scale our application, simply because vertical scaling can only work up to a point, more or less, given technological restrictions. And after that, our only other option is horizontal scaling, which is by definition a distributed system, right? Uh, the last thing I wanted to touch on here is how uh, we do things in the front end. Uh, you might be familiar with this idea of thick clients. Basically, you take all your business logic, and instead of putting it on the back end, you kind of move most of it towards the front end, right? Now, it turns out that serverless allows us to create uniquely lightweight backends, which can be a natural fit for things like thick clients and single page apps. So, as I said, serverless backends naturally fit these existing front end techniques. So in terms of the things that we do want to change, the things that we might want to do differently when we move to serverless, uh, the first is client-facing app patterns and app design patterns have improved a little bit since, right? Like I said, it turns out we can use other patterns to achieve a greater degree of separation concerns than we can with the, the model view controller approach. Also, distributed systems back then were notably harder to implement, right? Principally, you had to worry about ops and or orchestration. You probably had to worry about things like Kubernetes or unmanaged components within your distributed system, right? Uh, now, also, another thing was back then, there were no real tools for doing lightweight event processing, right? Or excuse me, lightweight yet flexible event processing. The best you could do was something like if this, then that, right? Which is good as long as you as long as its WYSIWYG approach contains whatever you're trying to get done, but the second that it doesn't, you more or less can't just write raw code on top of something like that, right? Um, so adding your own custom logic, like I said, meant writing your entire application from scratch. So that begs the question, uh, well, what does serverless change? What does serverless bring to the table that is inherently different than this pre-serverless world? So the first thing to bear in mind is that serverless is more capital E evolutionary than capital R revolutionary, right? Um, so the serverless way, naturally, is more of an evolution of old approaches than a completely new approach in, of, in and of itself. Uh, distributed systems, uh, the way those work is you're starting to see increasingly serverless versions of core distributed systems primitives, so things like caches, message queues, so on and so forth. And you're starting to see um, the high-level architectural principles actually not change. Uh, they more or less stay the same uh, when you move from this non-serverless distributed architecture to the serverless variant, right? And as a hands-on demo of what this looks like, 
so let's say we have a pretty canonical distributed system here. Uh, it just kind of accepts a stream of image resize requests, uses a message queue to load balance those across some set of compute units. And those compute units will then resize those images and do something with them, whether it's returning them back or storing them in, in some sort of storage or something like that, right? Now, this is the old school way of doing things. We had our message queue presumably running on some sort of infrastructure as a service. So this might be like RabbitMQ or whatever. Uh, and then that was load balancing amongst a bunch of compute units, right? Which in this case are raw uh, compute engine VMs. Now, the downside of this is we have to still worry about that ops component, right? Yes, it works. Yes, it's scalable. But we still have to worry about the, the GCE or GKE ops workload. So if we move to the serverless um, version of this, of course, we have less of that ops concern. But the beauty of this is that we can kind of transliterate these non-serverless components over here pretty much just to serverless components off the bat, right? Uh, we're not even saying, OK, well, we have to do anything different with our message queue, or we have to do anything different, use some sort of different um, version of compute. Uh, all we're doing is we're taking a non-serverless component, swapping it out for a serverless component, and once we make that change, making any uh, required code changes to mesh the two together, right? Uh, and for reference, the products on the right here, uh, essentially what we're doing is we're taking that, um, again, that message queue that is running on infrastructure, swapping it out with its serverless alternative, which is something like Google Cloud PubSub. We're taking the server full compute and swapping it out with serverless compute, which in this case is Cloud Functions. So in terms of what else is new, uh, so web front-end ideas, and I kind of already touched on this, uh, also already fit this serverless world quite well. So notably, things like HTML templating and static file hosting haven't really changed. Uh, CDNs, whatnot, they're all still relevant. Um, but thick clients is really where serverless kind of comes into its own, right? The idea of a thick client, a thick front end, is not new. But once you pair that with the thin backends afforded by serverless, uh, this means you can get really good meshing between your front end and your back end. So uh, as an example of how this works sort of in the real world or with a contrived problem, admittedly, uh, so let's say we have this example pet store here, right? Uh, so there are a couple different actions that the users can take. Those are all sort of our views on the front end, the list, buy, cart, and pay URLs. Uh, and then we're backing this with a monolith running on GKE for its sort of backend compute. And then we have a bunch of uh, primitives or components off to the right here. So uh, you'll see there that the first component in that list of primitives is a SQL database, right? Now, if you're thinking, OK, well, I want to scale this thing, that SQL database can scale up to a point, but I'm not going to be able to horizontally scale that, right? I'm eventually going to hit a bottleneck, and I'm going to have to get rid of that SQL database, right? You might think, OK, well, I can just migrate that, that SQL database to a no SQL alternative, and boom, I'll have horizontal scalability, right? Uh, and that is correct, right? This application as it is, if you architect it in the right way, uh, is horizontally scalable. It will scale up and scale down to meet demand. But it's not entirely serverless. You still have to worry about things like orchestration and ops, right? Because you have your uh, sort of serverful compute. You have your serverful primitives. Uh, but if you want to sort of abstract that ops workload away, if you want to start moving towards serverless, uh, what you can do is say, OK, well, I'm going to start with the primitives, right? And again, like we did in the previous example, uh, we can transliterate those primitives, not even translate, transliterate those primitives uh, from, from their uh, server full options to their serverless options, right? So we might look at this and say, well, we have a NoSQL database, right? And we have a log service. And those are server full. Those are running on some sort of infrastructure. Now, what is a serverless log service, right? Something like Stack Driver Logging. What is a serverless NoSQL database? Something like Cloud Data Store or Cloud Firestore, right? So it turns out, if we just kind of do that transliteration and then update our code accordingly, we can say, OK, boom, we've got our primitives running on serverless. We've more or less reduced our ops workload by migrating everything, right? But there's still the elephant in the room, or rather the elephant in the architecture here, uh, which is that monolith in the middle, right? So if you wanted to do a simple, well, not so simple. If you wanted to do the easiest possible lift and shift to get on the serverless, you might say, well, maybe I want to put that on some sort of server raw serverless compute option like Cloud Run or maybe maybe App Engine, right? Cloud Run would probably be ideal if you wanted the least effort lift and shift for something like a GKE cluster, right? But uh, you're in this situation where you're dealing with a thick client. You say, OK, well, maybe we should take the time to re-architect this so we can really take advantage of not only serverless, but the advantages afforded uh, to us by this thick client on the front end. right? Um, so what you can do is say, well, if we're going to go the extra mile, let's go ahead and migrate this to something like Cloud Functions, some sort of serverless compute option. 
Uh, and by doing that, not only do we get the, the benefits of serverless in terms of ops and scalability, but we build an architecture that is better suited to this idea of the thick client front end, right? As opposed to having this massive back end and this massive front end where there's also all sorts of logic duplication, all sorts of additional maintenance, all sorts of bad things that you're doing on both for really no good reason, right? So uh, in terms of what else is new, um, what's changed a little bit in terms of abstraction is back then, we only really had one option, and that was infrastructure. Uh, so that meant that we had more work, but we also had more control and visibility of our, over our deployments, right? Nowadays, uh, the beauty of serverless is that it strictly gives us additional options, right? So in terms of serverless options, it gives us a lower getting started point, a lower minimum in terms of the work that we have to do. But if we want that additional control and additional visibility, we can still say, hey, serverless isn't right for me. I want these things, so I'm going to go off you know, towards the infrastructure side of things, right? Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, with the default cost model, it has changed a little bit. Uh, for non-serverless platforms, it used to be we would set a billing limit and then we would fail at that point, right? Um, so once we hit that quota, we basically serve the user a quota exceeded error or something like that. Uh, and the beauty of that is if we got a sudden deluge of requests that we didn't want to fulfill, say it was a denial of service attack or a bug in our code, then this is the right approach and we wouldn't be charged for filling requests that we didn't fulfill, right? Uh, nowadays, the approach with serverless is essentially scale now, pay later, right? Um, now, this approach works well when you get a sudden deluge of legitimate requests. Say, for example, your marketing team knocks it out of the park, uh, and you come into work next day, and you, know, you pick up your copy of you know, your favorite national newspaper, and your app is right there on the front page, right? And suddenly, everyone in the country or everyone across the world um, is trying your application. And your user base has gone up by like 10 or 50x or whatever. In that sort of situation, you want to make sure that your application can scale up to handle that demand rather than serving all of your you know, new users a bunch of quota exceeded errors, right? Because that leaves a very bad impression uh, as to your application. So uh, the one thing I do want to note is that this is a these are defaults. Uh, they can be changed. Uh, so if you are in a situation where you're using non-serverless, but you want it to you know, sort of have that unrestricted scaling cap capability, you can do that. Uh, if you're also in a situation where you want to use serverless, but you want to restrict its ability to scale, that is something you can do as well. Uh, so now I'm going to touch on the good stuff, the, the uh, actual design patterns that we're going to be using in this serverless environment. So uh, first of all, a quick uh, intro into the things that have changed. Uh, so the first design pattern that we do a little bit differently is how we do busy wait, right? So uh, back in the old days, we used to be able to rely on things like callbacks or blocking calls and kind of wait around for long-running tasks to complete, right? Uh, nowadays, we try to rely more on message passing uh, and things like callbacks with their own separate endpoints, uh, which I'll show in the next slide. So in terms of what this looks like with a hands-on example, uh, the old school way of doing things might be to say, OK, well, we're going to do some effectively instantaneous operation, right? like getting a user ID. Uh, then we're going to kick off some slow, long-running external operation. And then we're going to wait. We're going to kind of walk around stage, take a sip of our coffee, you know, twiddle our thumbs, whatever, go to the bathroom. Uh, and then once that operation is done, now, bear in mind, while we're waiting this operation, we still have that Cloud Functions instance running. That is still reserved. That is still uh, costing us compute time. Now, that that operation is done, then uh, we write the result to the database. Now, there are two big problems with this. One, uh, the first thing is Cloud Functions has a nine-minute timeout, right, at most. So if this slow external operation takes longer than nine minutes, what will actually end up happening is something like that. That last line of code will not execute. Your function will throw a timeout error, and it will cease ex execution. Um, now, the second problem is that you're, even if this operation does complete, even if it, say, takes six or seven minutes, you're still paying for seven minutes worth of compute where you're not really doing anything during those seven minutes, right? You're just kind of sitting around waiting for this operation to complete. So, of course, that was then, and this begs the question, well, how can we do this in a better way? So it turns out we can do it in a better way. 
Uh, so what we want to do is essentially take all of our instant operations, our synchronous operations, and put them in one function, right? And then we want to take that slow external operation and turn it into some sort of asynchronous alternative, right? Now, there are a couple ways we can do this. Uh, some operations, such as those with the data loss prevention API, give us the ability to pass in a pub subtopic that will then be notified when that operation is complete, right? So we essentially say, hey, uh, slow external operation, when you're done, can you publish a ping to this topic, my topic? And that slow external operation says, yeah, sure, I can do that. And I can also include this uh, ID as metadata if you want me to. Uh, so once we do that, we can say, OK, great. I'm going to go to sleep now. This cloud function is going to go to sleep now after kicking off this external operation. And it doesn't matter how long that external operation takes. Once it's done, that pub sub message will be fired, and it will trigger the second cloud function that writes this result to the database. Right. And again, it doesn't. Uh, in this case, this solves both of those two problems, right? It solves the timeout problem because um, once that slow external operation is kicked off, uh, this cloud function can exit and say, "I don't have to do anything anymore," right? If it takes, you know, all of 100 milliseconds to kick that operation off, then you're being charged for 100 milliseconds plus whatever it costs to get the user ID. You're not being charged for the amount of time that the operation is running. And second, even if that operation takes an hour, right? Uh, you don't have to worry about that timeout because this cloud function is only running for you know however long it needs to get that ID and kick off the operation, not actually wait for the operation to complete. So the next pattern I want to touch on is how we do session affinity, right? Uh, and basically, the idea with this is back then we could rely on session affinity, which essentially means that if we send a if a user sends, like, say, 10 requests, uh, that those 10 requests will all go to the same machine, right? You might be using a distributed architecture. You might have you know, thousands of machines across your entire application, but each user will always go to the same machine, more or less, right? Now, nowadays with serverless, that's increasingly not available, right? Uh, so a user's request may hit different machines. And this affects how we're going to store state uh, through those user requests, right? Um, the second thing I wanted to touch on here is ex explicitly machine state, right? Not just user state, but the state of the machines themselves. So uh, back then, we could also rely on things like persistent machines. We could rely on saying, OK, I want to save this to disk, or I want to save this to RAM. And I can trust that when the user comes back, that it'll still be there, right? Nowadays, uh, we're increasingly moving to ephem ephemeral architectures, right? Uh, so there are no guarantees in terms of uh, where the user is going to land. They might make 10 different requests, uh, or excuse me, they might make 10 different requests, and the machine could start up and shut down and start up and shut down 10 different times, right? Even if, they, even if you have session affinity, even if it goes to the same machine every time, it doesn't really matter, uh, because if that machine was provisioned and deprovisioned and provisioned and deprovisioned, then those deprovisionings can wipe state from that machine, right? Uh, and of course, going back to session affinity a little bit, uh, that is doubly a problem. Uh, because even if you have those persistent machines, it doesn't really matter if the user could hit you know, 10 different machines across 10 different requests. So the solution to both of these problems is you're going to want to persist your data outside of your actual compute, right? So once that request is done, maybe you send it off to some sort of cache, or you send it off to some sort of cloud data store, or something like that. The idea is you're not relying on any state within the serverless compute option itself, because that state is essentially ephemeral. Um, so a couple more things I wanted to touch on um, in terms of design patterns. So first, uh, how we do retries has changed a little bit, right? So retrialable operations, it used to be we kind of had to have our own doctor node, if you will, that would say, OK, this operation failed. Uh, I'm going to go retry that, and I'm going to keep retrying this operation until it succeeds. Increasingly, uh, that is being offloaded to serverless alternatives, such as serverless message queues. So we can use things like PubSub and Cloud Tasks as our sort of artificial doctor nodes, where they will say, OK, I'm going to retry this operation, for example, for PubSub. I'm going to retry this operation until you actually acknowledge receiving my message. right? And if your operation fails, you simply say, OK, I'm not going to acknowledge that PubSub message. And it will automatically send me another copy of that message when it's ready. right? Uh, now, another thing that changes, I, I kind of alluded to this in some of the previous slides, but is how we uh, can take advantage of separation of concerns, right? So it used to be back then we would rely on something like the MVC approach, the model view controller model. Uh, nowadays, we can take advantage of what's known as the microservice pattern, right? And this is a little bit of a buzzword, uh, but 
which we'll explain in the next slide. Uh, but essentially what it means is that we can achieve, like I said, that greater separation of concerns. So uh, in terms of what this microservice th uh, term actually means, uh, what we're talking about here is the idea that apps are collections of small services, right? Um, so each service has its own narrowly scoped purpose, as well as its own code base. Now, how you store these code bases is highly dependent on your particular situation. Uh, but some common patterns that we've seen, uh, you might say, OK, well, I want to put all of my code for my application in one giant version control repo, and then have a bunch of directories, each directory corresponding to a microservice. right? You might also say in your situation, maybe it's easier to set up CI, CD in this manner, um, continuous ing integration and deployment. Uh, you might say, OK, I want to put each of these services in its own repo, right? Whatever situation makes sense for you, uh, that's, that's what you should do. There is no one right answer here. Uh, now, some of the benefits of this microservice pattern versus the MVC approach. Uh, first of all, we get per service control of a bunch of different things, uh, namely things like scaling, permissions, and access control. We also get uh, the enforcement of good API design, right? Now, this can be a double-edged sword, uh, depending on your situation. If you're working on something that's just a quick hack, a quick prototype, you probably don't want something like this. You may not want the microservice pattern. But if you're working on a team with dozens or hundreds of people, and you're trying to build something that is going to last for years, then having that consistent uh, API enforcement, that consistent software engineering practice, can actually be really helpful in terms of the longevity of those larger code bases. And last but not least, this is one of the key benefits of, uh, of microservices. They give us this uh, language and stack independence, right? Um, so for example, if you wanted to write a, um, an application and there were five microservices, you could write it uh, with five different stacks, five different languages. You could say, I want to write these two in Java. I want to write this one in C++. I want to write that one in C Sharp. And I want to write that one in Node. Uh, and as long as they have a common communication uh, protocol, such as JSON over HTTP or protobuf or something like that, then you're good. right? As long as they can talk to each other uh, and they know each other's APIs, then you can do whatever, essentially whatever you want in terms of tech stack. right? So um, as an example of how this works, uh, here's our canonical pet store again. Uh, so this is the MVC approach, right? We have our views on the left, uh, which again are our front ends. We have our controllers in the middle, which is our business logic. And then we have our models on the right. Now, if you look at this, you'll notice that there's a lot of complexity going on between the checkout method and all these various models. In fact, it's connecting to the user method, the pay method, and the user cart, or the user model, excuse me, the pay method uh, model and the user cart model as well. So of course, that complexity means it's very hard for us to separate those two components, which kind of makes us sad, right? Uh, we can't exactly just go say, oh, I just want to reuse checkout over here. We have to kind of yank all those models out of it. So uh, in terms of what this looks in, like in the microservice as app world, you might even glance at this and say, wow, this is crazy. How is this any simpler uh, than that MVC approach? There's so much stuff going on here. But the reality is, when you look at, if you look at it in the right way, you'll start to see, OK, well, the separation of concerns looks something like this. right? So you have your pet service, which has its own database, has its own backend logic. And all it cares about are three API methods, right? list pets, add pet, and remove pet. So if it's its own sort of create, read, update, delete information storage service, the beauty of this is you can change whatever internal details of the pet service that you want to without having to worry about the rest of the services. Right? The only time you need to worry about the other services is when you're changing the external facing APIs. Uh, now, of course, because this is a microservice architecture, uh, the cart service, same thing, right? Uh, you can change, you could say, OK, it's running on Java. I want to code it in Python, right? It's running on Python. I want to move it to C Sharp, whatever. As long as that API interface remains the same, you can change essentially whatever you want. Um, and of course, the pay service is no different. It's also isolated. Now, note that this does call out to those other microservices. Um, so you would have to update it if those microservices changed. But again, the actual sort of inner backend logic here is totally isolated uh, from what happens elsewhere. So in terms of bridging the gap between these two worlds, between the, the pre-serverless world and the serverless world we live in today, uh, the first thing you're going to want to be aware of is that there's 
uh, among many uh, different problems, there's one really big one, right? Uh, and that is this idea of non-scalable or not quite serverless parts. Uh, if you have parts that are scalable but not serverless, they're a little easier to deal with. But non-scalable parts mean that you have to do things a little bit differently. Uh, so notably, what you're going to want to do is um, treat this as essentially what academics would call a producer-consumer problem, right? Which means you have a producer, you have something producing tasks, and then you have a consumer that is consuming those tasks. Now, your producer might be serverless, your producer might be scalable, but if your consumer is not, you want to make sure you don't overload your consumer with so many requests that it buckles under the pressure. So what you can do is use PubSub or Cloud Tasks or some sort of serverless message queue as a task buffer, right? And that buffer will kind of throttle how many tasks are coming out within a given amount of time or within a given uh, set of parameters and ensure that your downstream service that can only handle, say, x tasks a minute or x tasks per whatever period or x, x tax, tasks excuse me, at once uh, does not get overloaded with so many tasks that it buckles under the pressure. Um, and if you need additional sort of fine-tuned logic on top of this, you can use things like App Engine or Cloud Functions uh, to give you that additional consumer logic, right? Now, this fine-tuned logic might be that, say, PubSub and Cloud Tasks don't support exactly the throttling policies you want, so then you have to implement them in some sort of serverless compute option, which, because it's serverless, can handle that volume of, of requests. Or it might be that you want to take those requests, you want to perform some modification to them, and only then do you want to send them to your downstream service, right? Regardless of which one of those situations you're in, having this additional layer of serverless compute can help you achieve that. So uh, some rules of thumb when it comes to migrating to serverless. Note, of course, this is a very, very, very complex topic. Uh, if, you're seriously, if you or your company are seriously considering sort of undertaking this journey, um, what I recommend is you check out uh, the talk by my colleagues Martin Omander and Adam Ross, uh, Serverless 202 from Monolith to Microservices. They will take you through this in a lot more detail than I'm about to now. Um, but essentially what you want to remember, first of all, serverless is not magic, right? Uh, things like data dependencies, things like slow I.O., things like application security, these still exist. They are still concerned. Serverless is helpful, but it does not, it's not a panacea. It does not solve everything. Um, so the second thing, uh, when you're doing this migration, you, generally speaking, want to do it slowly and piece by piece. Because if things break, it's easier to isolate what the cause of that breakage was if you kind of go slow and don't, don't rush it through, right? Uh, now, you also don't want to go all or nothing uh, in terms of old approaches, right? Uh, like I said, serverless is more capital E evolutionary than capital R revolutionary. Uh, so you want to take advantage of this. You want to take advantage of the sort of prior art that exists in this old world uh, that will enable you to leverage that to build your new serverless architecture. You don't want to, say, reinvent the wheel, so to speak. And last but not least, uh, when it comes to making your app totally serverless, uh, this will give you a slight boost, uh, because at that point, you won't have to worry about things like ops anymore, more or less. Uh, you'll have a much more scalable app if, if you're dealing with non-scalable components. Uh, but the thing to bear in mind is this is not a reason to migrate your application all at once. The benefit from going totally serverless is totally outweighed uh, by the cost that may be imposed by migrating your app all at once if anything goes wrong. So definitely, despite this, this is a reason to sort of see it through. But it's not a reason to rush that migration process, though. So um, now that we've touched on some of the things that have changed, some of the 0 to 1 uh, changes in terms of serverless, I wanted to take a moment to talk about the the capital R revolutionary aspect of serverless, right? Um, so these are new patterns that we can take advantage of uh, that were not really available to us before serverless and things like functions as a service showed up. So the first of these patterns is how we do event processing and automation, right? Uh, so it used to be that if we wanted lightweight deployments, uh, we had to use some sort of, well, to be honest, they didn't exist, right? Uh, the best we could do is use infrastructure, which was kind of heavyweight. Uh, even if we said, OK, here's this 10 lines of code, every time I get a Gmail message, run this code, right? That would mean setting up a whole entire application for those 10 lines of code. And uh, it just really wasn't worth it in terms of the time we'd save by writing all this automation, right? Uh, nowadays, what we can do is increasingly rely on just individual functions, single functions, and we can say, hey, all I have to do if I want to run this 10 lines of code is write the 10 lines of code and stick it up on Cloud Functions, right? I don't have to worry about, OK, I wrote the 10 lines of code. Now I have to set up, say, you know, infrastructure. I have to set up maybe a LAMP stack or something like that. Uh, another thing I want to touch on here is um, the ubiquity of events, right? Uh, so things like webhooks and PubSub are 
are common today, but they're becoming increasingly common uh, in the future, right? Uh, now, webhooks are common with external platforms. Uh, what you also see uh, with PubSub is that you can access a lot of events um, through things like stack driver logging, right? Uh, so as we mentioned previously in that, that busy wait slide, uh, not all operations will have access to a PubSub notification when they're complete, but a lot of operations will instead notify, log the stack driver when that operation is finished. So that's something where you can say, OK, well, I'm going to take that stack driver notification. I'm going to export that stack driver logging notification to PubSub, and then PubSub is going to use that to trigger a cloud function, right? So essentially, and there's a tutorial on this uh, on, our, on our site if you go to cloud.google.com slash function slash docs. This is a tutorial that walks you through how to trigger a cloud function in response to a stack driver notification. So the TLDR here is not only is webhooks or not only are webhooks and PubSub becoming increasingly common, but various other services like Stackdriver are also starting to feed into PubSub that can essentially be converted into PubSub notifications. Uh, and of course, uh, G Suite is no different. Uh, so G Suite integration is also becoming easier through things like REST APIs. And this type of thing allows you to take advantage of line of business automation and making your day-to-day -day workflow more efficient uh, using, using various forms of code, right? Uh, for those of you that have seen any of the like, automation charts out there, um, there's a particularly famous one from uh, a certain web comic. Uh, but essentially, the way that works is you have you have a certain amount of time that you save by doing that automation, right? Like maybe you run this task you know, x times a day or x times a week. Uh, it takes y amount of time. And it would take you z amount of time to automate it, right? And depending on those parameters, it's either worth it or not worth it to automate that task. Uh, now, where this serverless pattern becomes really useful is if you want to make those sorts of lightweight G Suite automations, like I said, line of business automations, uh, you can do that, right? Uh, because serverless decreases that z for you. It decreases the amount of time that it would take to set up an automation for a given task. Uh, now, rapid prototyping is another thing that changes a little bit. Notably, uh, rapid prototyping in a serverless world uh, means that serverless is great for gluing together disparate APIs, right? Uh, so let's say you have ta a constellation of really powerful APIs that do really interesting things. Then you can quickly stitch them together using things like Cloud Functions and our other serverless offerings uh, and use that to create easily scaled apps, right? Uh, which is great because if you build something that is you know, the next best thing but you don't know it yet and you tell your friends, and suddenly, you know, you wake up tomorrow morning and it's on, you know, like I said, it's on a national newspaper or something because it's the best thing since sliced bread, then you want to make sure you can handle that scaling, right? Uh, and that's why serverless is great for that kind of workload. Uh, now, a corollary that I wanted to touch on real quickly uh, is also how we do market testing, right? Uh, so if you want to build something where you're not sure what the addressable market for it is, um, serverless is great because it will give you, first of all, a typically smaller upfront cost than non-serverless platforms, right? Uh, now, this is in two ways. This reduced cost takes uh, place in two ways. The first is the compute cost is pay-as-you-go. Uh, so it's very easy to say, OK, well, if I don't use as much compute as I think I'll need to, then I don't have to commit to a certain amount of compute. I can just pay as I go. If you underestimate how many users you're going to get, then you can say, OK, well, I didn't have to pay for 10,000 users worth of compute. I can just pay for you know, whatever 1,000, uh, however many users I actually get. right? So you're not on the, on the hook for that. Now, if you're in the opposite situation where you think you're going to get, say, 10,000 users, and you end up getting 100,000 or you know, a million, right? the scalability inherent in serverless means that apps can handle those sudden explosions in popularity. Uh, now, of course, you have to design your application in the right way, uh, which is why we're covering design patterns here. Uh, but if you do that, then serverless can generally say, oh, I understand. You told me that we were going to get you know, 1,000 users, but maybe we got 10,000 or 100,000. No biggie. Don't worry about it. I can scale, right? So uh, as far as a quick uh, recap of everything we covered today, uh, the first thing to bear in mind is that serverless is more capital E evolutionary than capital R revolutionary, right? Uh, so many serverless patterns are essentially uh, updated versions of older patterns, right? Uh, and that being said, serverless does fit neatly within a lot of these existing patterns. So things like microservice use can help us increase our separation of concerns, uh, which can make our code easier to maintain and reuse. Uh, also, these serverless backends are uniquely a good fit, or a, a uniquely good fit, excuse me, uh, for thick client front ends, right? If most of our business logic is on the front end, then we can take advantage of this to get a uniquely lightweight backend. 
Uh, and of course, uh, how we persist state has kind of changed. Uh, when we're dealing with serverless compute, we persist that state outside of compute. Uh, and of course, caching, things like caching and persisting your data stores may become increasingly important. Now, uh, one more slide that I wanted to recap on. Uh, so this asynchronous mindset is, of course, key in the serverless environment, right? Uh, so we're starting to see things like decomposition take hold, where we take all these tasks, we decompose them, and then wrap those subtasks around using various messaging strategies, such as PubSub, Cloud Tasks, and HTTP. Typically, you'll see PubSub and Cloud Tasks. HTTP is less common, but it does happen in some cases. Uh, now, of course, the benefits of this approach, uh, you get, generally speaking, a br better throughput uh, and scaling performance in your application. You also get uh, reduced busy wait cost if you're dealing with long-running operations, right? And as I said, not all of those operations uh, will conform to that exact PubSub model. Sometimes you have to rely on things like Stackdriver or webhooks or whatever, but the same logic applies. Uh, now, if you're dealing with flow control because you have to do some throttling or retry logic or something like that, uh, perhaps you have some sort of non-scalable component somewhere in your architecture or some retriable function, uh, that's where you're going to want to use something like PubSub. And if you need that compute, you're going to want to use something like App Engine or Cloud Functions. Uh, you may not need that compute, in which case you might just use PubSub, you might just use Cloud Tasks, something like that. Uh, now, of course, serverless opens up a, a bunch of new possibilities. Like I said, it's, it's more evolutionary, capital E evolutionary than capital R revolutionary, but it does have its capital R revolutionary aspects, right? Um, so first of all, how we do lightweight event processing uh, is increasingly being modernized through things like uh, functions as a service. And second, serverless enables us to do rapid prototyping and rapid scaling at the same time. They are no longer mutually exclusive. We don't have to say, we want this to scale rapidly, so we have to set up a bunch of orchestration and do a bunch of configuration to get that scalability. We can just build our application more or less, throw it on serverless, and as long as we design our app in the right way, it will just automatically scale up and scale down uh, with whatever workload we throw at it. So that's it from me. Uh, if you have any questions, please do reach out to me via email at fast at google.com. Uh, that's the word fast with two A's, uh, or functions as a service. My team and I couldn't figure out what the T st stood for. It just sounded nice. Uh, and then, of course, you can hit me up on Twitter at serverloss as well.